Welcome to Pocket Fiction by Steve Cook. The Climb, Part 5, Canopy. Peter put down his quill and stoppered the little bottle of ink. That was nearly gone too, along with the food. Losing the meat had nearly destroyed this venture. At least water, collected in little pools on the broad green leaves, was in plentiful supply. Underfoot, the wood of the tree was faintly warm to the touch, thin wisps of something like straw providing a little comfort, but the wind howling in through the gaping opening in the arbor's bark whipped around the chamber, blowing the larger branches that were piled up in the lower part. Moss and pieces of dead leaf flicked up and around, the nest, what else could that tangle of bark and leaf mass be, being slowly destroyed by the storm? Shivering, Peter gathered a pile of the straw into a corner, far away from the drop down to the lower section, and wrapped his robe around himself. In the darkness, with only the rising choir of the gale outside to compliment him, he began to pray. Have mercy upon your child, who trespasses upon you in search of knowledge, he murmured. Have mercy upon your child, who seeks only to understand more about you. Have mercy. Somehow, he slept. In his dreams, black wings flapped, silhouetted against a bright sun, closer, always closer. Or was he rising to meet them? The next morning, the wind had calmed. Peter groaned as he staggered to his feet, joints aching. A month's growth of beard made him feel unwashed, almost as though the dirt was ingrained now, and he grimaced as he slid down the escarpment to the lower area, then made his way to the opening. The sun was bright, all the colour seeming too real this high up. The vine road was there waiting for him, of course, twining its way around the arbour. It was thinner now, only just wide enough for him to walk normally, and with a sigh he began his day's climb. Muscles that had screamed in protest merely a week earlier now moved more surely, and his pace was brisk, but within only two hours the road had narrowed to the point where he was having to put one hand on the arbor's rough bark to keep his balance. The turns were coming faster as well, and as Peter looked up he realised that the thick ceiling of green was closer. He paused on a thin branch to make a note in his journal and catch his breath. There was almost no breeze, but the quiet susurration of leaves soothed him, and he closed his eyes for a moment. A screeching sound echoed around him, and fear gripped him. There was nothing that he could see, only the green of leaves and the brown of the bark. Heart pounding, he stuffed his journal back into his bag and slung it onto his shoulder. Keeping low, he made his way back along the branch towards the trunk. The screech sounded again, louder, closer, like the bellowing of some enormous beast it rang around him. No, he realised, like the call of some enormous bird of prey. For long minutes he stood with his back to the trunk, eyes darting this way or that, but only the leaves were moving. Peter breathed in, then out, trying to still the fluttering of his fear. Old fool, he murmured, whatever's up there, you came to find it. Shakily, he began to climb again. The vine road narrowed still further, and then the path ended abruptly at a branch, though the vine continued upwards like a ladder. With little else to do, Peter began to clamber up. The temperature grew cool, then cold, and finally he began to notice difficulty in drawing the thinner air into his lungs. Leaves began to press in on all sides, damp and clammy, and when he looked down at his robe it was being stained a muddy, mossy green, fresh dye being added by every touch of the foliage. With one final push of his legs, he broke through into clear skies, clinging on to the stem he'd been climbing, which thinned to nothing in just a few feet. He looked around. The leaves blended together to form something like a plain of unbroken grass, almost solid enough to put his feet on, and, tentatively, he took a step away from the ladder, Sure enough, though springy, the leaves were firm enough to take his weight. 
the full enormity of what he had done trickled into his mind, and a kind of euphoria gripped him. At the top of the world, conqueror of a climb that had never been attempted, Peter knelt and gave thanks, tears streaming from his eyes. Several minutes passed before he was able to take out his journal and shakily scrawl the words that he had longed to write. I have climbed the arbour, the first among men to do so, and you are not the first. The voice came from behind him, two-toned and cold. Peter scrambled around and away, upsetting the ink bottle. A little stain of black began to spread over the pure green leaf he was sat on. Before him stood a man-shape, completely green. It had the faintest suggestions of features, nose, mouth, hollows where the eyes should be. It was bald, naked, entirely sexless. You are are not not the the first, first, it repeated, towering over him and blocking the sunlight. Five Five of your your human human generations ago, ago, one climbed to my crown. He He thought to uncover secrets here. here. Five Five generations generations before that, a woman woman climbed, climbed, seeking a cure cure for the illness that plagued her. She She died, never never knowing that the cure lay within her her own body. body. As it spoke, emotionless and smooth, Peter began to ease away, scooting backwards from his supine position. For every two feet he backed off, the figure stepped forward, slowly, menacingly. In In your your human human history, history, many many have have made made the the climb. climb. In In the the early days, days, when when I was but newly come come to this world, world, I thought you worth treating with. Much Much information was passed between us. You You learned from me, and and in gratitude you spread my seeds to all corners of the world. world. Then you came, with with axe and and flame, to to destroy me, to to rape my body, and and dance on the remains. That That was when I created the Guardian. From behind Peter... The shriek of the monstrous birds sounded again, and he looked around as a vast shadow flickered over the canopy. Feathered wings outstretched. No, not feathers. They were leaves. It came in for a landing. Somehow the canopy was able to take the weight of its immense wooden body, smoothed as polished mahogany, and it sank its thorny talons into the leaves as it stalked towards the cowering priest. Its eyes revolved in its head like polished parquet orbs. Several different colours and grains of wood visible as it fixed its eye on him. Its folded wings giving the impression of a cloak drawn around its shoulders. It stopped behind the green man-shape, staring down its cruel beak at Peter. The Guardian was enough to scare away most of those who came later. But humans have forgotten their fear, or overcome it, in recent centuries. Barbarism and savagery have always come on the heels of those such as you. Finding his voice at last, Peter shook his head vigorously. No! We revere the arbour! The realisation almost stilled his tongue, but he pressed on. We revere... you. There is no record of us fighting you or trying to destroy you. This This is millennia millennia ago, mortal. I I rose up and crushed them, for humanity had not gauged even a fraction of my strength or power. The arbour gestured around at the tree in general. Few survived, and those that did enshrined this vessel in their religion. That was satisfying to me. It left me to my work, and you to scratch out your tiny existences on the surface of this planet. Peter struggled to his knees and shot a glance at the ladder leading back into the canopy. Could he make it in time? He licked his dry, cracked lips. What is your work? Myriad species decorate this galaxy. My task is to catalogue, annotate, process. Who gave you this task? The figure shook its head. You You see? see? Impertinent. What What is is life without without purpose? purpose? I I exist, exist, so I purposed myself. Peter rose. Though his heart still quailed in his breast, it was becoming clear that this figure did not mean to end him then and there. What you call impertinence, I call curiosity. I'm a researcher, a cataloguer. My own mission to determine what was up here led me here and will lead others. The figure cocked its head to one side. And And humanity's humanity's curiosity curiosity has begun begun to reach the bounds bounds of life on the ground. ground. You You would would agree agree with with this? this? Peter nodded. 
We're always seeking new frontiers, new heights. Your world up here represents an ultimate frontier for us. The figure took a step back. Then perhaps a more firm hand is required to ensure that my work can continue unhindered. If humanity has indeed begun to raise itself from the cradle of its civilization once again, it is beginning to return to the culture that attacked me all those millennia ago. No, we are peaceful enough. The arbor began to change then. It grew a little shorter, a little thinner. Its face swelled in some places, hollowed out in others, and a thick growth of grass-like fibres grew on its chin. From its feet upwards, the green yellowed, becoming similar to the flesh of a peach, before settling to a colour identical to Peter's skin. As the ripples of change finished their progress up its body, Peter realised he was staring at a body identical to his own, though naked. Your part should be easy to play, the other Peter said, and its voice was his now. In a blur of movement, the figure stepped forward, arm out, and then everything went dark. Forgive me, his last thought echoed in his mind. First day of April, 1456. I made my way back down to Rootholm today. I can only express my disappointment that the way to the summit of the tree is blocked by such ferocious creatures and by the thinning of the air. It is quite inhospitable to humans at that height. However, I am sure that I have managed to glean enough samples and information on this quest that we will not need to mount another for quite some time. In fact, it may not be safe to ever do so again. In the meantime, I intend to create copies of this diary and send them by messenger to the library and to the High Father, that all may know the sad futility of attempting another journey like this. I remain, forever, Father Peter Brennan. <laughs>